so today I will repeat myself, um, just using my more general. Um, I, I, I will describe the same things, not being very specific, and this will lead us to the general algorithm that solves linear Diophantine systems. So remember, this is always our setting, right? <coughs> Sorry. So A is an M times uh, D matrix, and B is a vector of uh, M elements. By the way, why do we call them uh, linear Diophantine systems? So this is a a linear Diophantine system, and I assume I should have said this like five days ago. But um, so the point is here: the coefficient matrix on the right-hand side are integers. We can always do that. We can also allow. Uh, Rational numbers, it doesn't matter, since we can always clear out and make them uh, integers. The point is uh, we require the non-negative part, okay? So the solutions have to be non-negative integers, and such equations are called Diophantine equations. So, okay, so we want to solve this system here. What did McMahon do? You take the system, and you write the crude generating function. So we take a multisum uh, over the d variables. We have d columns corresponding to the d variables. And we have uh, L1, lambda 1 to lambda m equations, right? The rows of uh, our matrix. And this is. Minus B1, yeah. so in general, we put uh, the inequalities on the, numer on the exponent of uh, the new variables we introduce, the auxiliary variable variables, and then we also put uh, Z1 to X1 up to Zd to Xd. Okay, this is a construction of the crude generating function, and then we move to the um, rational, yeah, so we want to apply omega on that, right? So, and then we say, okay, uh, we want to apply actually to the rational function, and how do we get the rational function? What is the numerator here? So, uh, this is multi-index notation. So, I always have indices, so whenever there is no index, this means Lambda 1 to be 1, lambda 2 to be 2, up to lambda d to be d. That's wrong. Lambda m to be m. Right? So this is our numerator. And what is the, the denominator? So we gather things according to x1, the first sum. We can decouple this sum into d sums, one for every variable, x. And uh, what we will get is, for the first one, we'll get one minus, um, we will get a lambda one to some exponent to, to, the, <coughs> to alpha i, uh, alpha one, one, right? This is the exponent of lambda 1 with respect to x1. So in general, if we gather all of this, let me write it again in uh, multi-index notation and hopefully get it right. So this will be um, let me denote by this the column, it's the first column, okay? Because we'll get for every lambda the thing that was in the first uh, column. So, okay. Now, obviously, this holds for all of them. So let me let me just say for i one two d.
like this, right? Okay. Good. And now we apply the omega operator on this thing with uh, whatever method we want. Um, Elliot, uh, Andrews, Paul, uh, a couple of more partial fraction decompositions before or after that. Uh, but uh, today we will not do any of this. So today we will see what this means, right? Okay. What are the generators here? If we consider we are in a space where our variables are zi's and lambda i's. So we have d zi's and m lambda i's, right? So we are in a space of m plus d dimensions, okay? And if this would be a cone, if this is the generating function of, uh, for the lattice points on a cone, in a cone, what, are, what would this be? What are the generators? So it is actually, I take, I put first the, the z's now, just because uh, I like this thing. So the first uh, product, the first term, uh, has, is Z1, the second is Z2, and every ZI appears only in one of these factors, right? Okay, so it will be uh, something like this, right? Because in the first part, if, if these, are, these are the D dimensions corresponding to the ZIs, this is a unit matrix, really. And what is below that, actually it's A, right? Because we get the columns of A here. So the first step, so what, what introduction of uh, the auxiliary variables mean blah, blah, blah? Yeah, just prepend a unit matrix to your matrix A, okay? And this we call McMahon lifting because it lifts things in a higher dimension. So, time for geometry. Now I will draw as if uh, we only had uh, one inequality. So I only have three dimensions to draw, right? So that's my eternal problem. So, what we do, let's assume we have uh, AX minus BY greater or equals C. Right? So, what is my matrix now? It would be 1, 0, A. Well, it's a very small column of only one element. And 0, 1, B. Right? And also, I will lift the, the, the for the right hand side, I just prepend zeros and then I, I put my B. Okay? Because I have nothing, I mean, this, this could also be considered as zi, as the product of uh, zi to the zero, right? And this, this is my, by the way, I didn't mention, but this is the right-hand side, the thing that we get uh, from here. Okay, now, This is my uh, cone, which I shifted by minus C, like this, right? In order to fit with my generating function, I have to do a shift, because I multiply with a monomial, with a monomial minus C to be exact. And then I have these, these two generators, which are uh, these lifted things, right? So this is the McMahon cone. And this cone has some intersection with the xy plane, xy being this. Okay, this was lambda. So, this was the first step, by the way. So we did the McMahon lifting. What is the second step? What do we do when we apply omega? We want to forget everything that is below my, uh, that has a negative lambda. So we have to forget everything 
that is below um, the xy plane, which means I want to only keep this part. This is gone. Right? Now, in here, we just, we just did the second step of omega. We, we rejected all terms that have no negative lambda exponents. Now, in here, there are some lattice points, right? Somewhere on this, on what remains of this cone, which is now a polyhedron, right? What is the next step in applying omega? We forget, we put lambda equal to one, which means orthogonal projection. So we take every point in here and project it in a more careful way than I did on the xy plane, just by forgetting the last coordinate, right? And now what we have is uh, this polytope, polyhedron, where all the lattice points are actually the solutions to our inequality. So if we have the, if we can compute the generating function for the lattice points in here, then this is exactly the application of the omega operator on our original uh, system. So this is the geometry of the omega operator, and here's how we do it. The first step, Trivial. McMahon lifting, very easy. Uh, what would be the second step? Yeah. We want to eliminate the last coordinate or also known as lambda n, right? The last lambda. We want to remove the auxiliary vari variables. That's how we solve things. So this means I will take the original cone and I have to cut with a half space. So take only the things that are above my hyperplane. And now you remember that I started talking like the first day about intersections, that's why. So here what we have is a polyhedron and we want to take intersection with a half space and this only works if things look all forward, all the cones look forward. So let's assume now that we are in a very high dimension and we have this cone which, uh, so yeah, this is an abstract version of uh, what you have to to think, but uh, then then we are here and we are cutting with this uh, hyperplane, like we cut here, our cone. I have a cone and I cut here, right? So we have the following intersections. We have an intersection here. We have an intersection there. And now instead of having a cone, we have a polyhedron, right? What it looks like is a like this. Okay, is it kind of clear what this means? Uh, so, I had this cone and I cut here. So now what I have is the thing that is above that. That's what I'm trying to draw. So, 
And what we want to do is, uh, if we do that, we eliminated, the, we only took things that are above uh, the last lambda coordinate, where the la this means that they have positive, yeah. So uh, the shorter arrows, are they supposed to be parallel to some hyperplane or landing? They, they, they live on this hyperplane, yes. I really should have used the slides for this. <laughs> so, so, this was the original cone, and then we cut with a hyperplane, right? So, now, remember Brion? We said that uh, for the rational generating function of a polyhedron, we need to sum up the rational generating functions of the vertex cones. What are the vertex cones here? So, we have one. A red cone here, and one yellow cone there, right? So if I knew the rational generating function of these two cones, then I know what is the rational generating function of the polyhedron. It's, the, it's just their sum, right? And it's a decomposition of this polyhedron. So what I want to do is, after I, I compute these, then I would just cut them again with the next thing I have to eliminate until I run out of lambdas to eliminate, in which case I'm actually here. I have uh, eliminated all the extra dimensions, right? So, okay. Then the only question that remains is if I have such a cone, how do I get this decomposition? Any suggestions? What do I need to know, first of all, in order to, to get this decomposition? So one is this vector. Let's go for the yellow one, right? So I need to know G1, this generator. I need to know this vector. And I need to know that vector, right? So let's call them V, W, and G. These are the three vectors I need to know in this setting. So what is this uh, V? A and remember, my input, my input was this point. So uh, G1, G2, G3, and apex. This was my input. I knew the cone, right? And I want to cut. So what is V? V is the intersection of uh, G1 with the hyperplane lambda n equals 0, right? Well, finding what is the vector, I mean, it's a G1. It's still the same, right? It's the same direction. Actually, I'm wrong. V1 is G1. This didn't change at all, the direction. OK? Uh, what about W? Maybe intersection or projection? Here, I'm not, I'm not projecting yet. So here, I mean, whatever dimension, I have this uh, cone. <coughs> which I only draw like with three generators, but it, may, it will have d, d generators in d dimensions, right? But uh, I will cut somewhere, and then I will get a bunch of cones, not necessarily two. Uh, I will get actually one cone for every generator that goes above the hyperplane where I cut. So here we will make a distinction. I cut with a hyperplane. Some generators go below, some go up. I will get as many Ver, uh, cones, as many as the <coughs> generators going up, because this is these points I will get, okay? And this point to compute is easy, because it is now, this is the intersection. Actually, I also need that, right? Yeah. So I need the, the, the apex. So the apex is the intersection of the vector 
z1 starting from q intersecting my hyperplane, which means that the last coordinate of this vector should be zero. It's easy to find this point. You mean the plane generated by g1 and g3? Because when we that, that's g. Yeah. So if we take this plane, g1 and g3, and the hyperplane where, where is it? The last coordinate is zero, which is like this. We take the intersection, and this will give us g. Uh, g is from there. V was input. Uh, w is just this minus that, which we can easily find. And actually, let me just say so that all of these are computed in the following way. So take the last coordinate of uh, the vector vj. So you are given two vectors, uh, g1, uh, g3. Mm, actually, v1, v3, sorry. Uh, this is uh, this times vi minus vi lambda vj, right? So just uh, forcibly make the last coordinate zero in the simplest possible way by cheating, multiplying with the last coordinate of the other one, right? And what you get is this vector. And this formula actually suffices, formula, whatever, this lin simple linear combination suffices to compute all these vectors. So essentially, we reduce the problem to just computing for all the vectors involved such combinations where the last coordinate is zero. And we get a Brion decomposition of our polyhedron. And now we can cut this Brion decomposition. So if needed, we have to flip some of these cones to look forward, to look all in the same di direction. And if we do this, we can cut again with the next hyperplane. Because we secured that we can take intersection if our cones look all in the same direction. OK. So questions? Yeah, I'm so happy everything is clear. So. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's not complicated. I think it's conceptually the simplest way to solve a linear Diophantine system. It's the simplest algorithm to solve linear Diophantine systems. Because now, we actually, if we do this, we end up with a bunch of cones, and we know that if we compute the rational generating function of, uh, what, is the final what is the result after this recursive elimination? We have uh, a set of cones uh, This is the generator matrix of the cone, this is the apex, and this is whether a face is open or not. So here's a, a trick. If I have a simplicial cone, I can identify a facet with the generator that is not included in, the, in that facet. So if we have a simplicial cone, we know that always, so if a facet will be generated by d minus one generators. So the one that is not, um, there's a one one to one correspondence between um, generators and the facets in which they are not in, right? Facets being the largest possible d minus one dimensional faces of a d dimensional polytope. So, and this is how this vector works. So, here if we would say one zero zero, it means the facet in which the first generator is not included, it is an open one. The rest are closed. Okay. So now we get a set of uh, I don't know how many really. So we get a bunch of cones, and what we know is that if we sum <coughs> the rational generating functions of this,
This is the rational generating function for the solutions of my original system. Okay, remember, I started from a system, I did the McMahon lifting, I took this cone, and I start cutting hyperplanes, eliminating the last variable. After I do this, I end up with a bunch of cones, and I know that the sum of the rational functions is the rational function I want to compute. Okay, how do we compute the rational function of uh, these cones? These cones are simplicial by construction. By the way, this is something that doesn't happen in general in polyhedral geometry, but thanks to McMahon, the geometry is simplified when we go in higher dimension, and when we cut, we always get simplicial cones. Remember I told you that we can always make them simplicial by triangulating, which is normally what happens. All other algorithms uh, that solve the same problem would do triangulations. We don't need to, because we will always get simplicial cones, thanks to McMahon's uh, trick to introduce these new dimensions. So, okay, then we are here. How do we write down, we know the cone, we know the generators, and uh, we know the um, apex, we know the openness. Okay, how do we write down the rational generating function? It's simple. This was one minus z to the g for g in gi, right? For g generator, or the product of all generators. We will also have to multiply by, to shift by the z to the alpha i, okay? But I'm missing something here, right? And for the moment, let's forget about openness. Let's say it's, everything is closed, it's fine. <coughs> what do I need here? The fundamental parallel pipette, right? And here's the bottleneck. Computing the fundamental parallel pipette may be really bad. Why is that? Let's talk a bit about complexity. Um, how many points can we have in the fundamental parallel pipette? It's the determinant, right? So if we have a generator matrix G, we have that many lattice points in the fundamental parallel pipette, which means that many terms in our numerator, right? Okay, how big is the determinant in comparison to the bit size of the input? So what is the bit complexity of that? So if, if uh, L is a... Uh, uh, So let's say L is the maximum bit size I need in order to represent any element in GI, in my matrix, right? By the way, this is not relevant, it doesn't matter that it's a generator matrix, like you have a matrix. What is the, uh, the how big can the determinant be with respect to the bit size of uh, your input? So let's take this matrix. Let's say this was an n by n matrix, right? So this is a to the n. How many, what is a? It's two to the l, right? If l is the bit size. And that would be what? Eh? Yeah? Is it there? Times n. Sorry? So to the l times n. Times n, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's exponential, is my point. So it's a lot. A lot, I mean, in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, it's not polynomial. So here's a question. Can we write this with uh, less than exponentially many monomials in the numerator? Actually, yes, we can. And this is, uh, 
Barbenoc 94. Uh, excellent uh, work proving that you only need polynomially many cones, but the decomposition has pluses and minuses. Okay? So, actually, it is worth giving you just the simple example, which I think I did use already. So, let's say we have this cone, which is 1, 5, 1, 0. What is the determinant of this cone? Ah, why, why am I... What is the determinant of C? It is 5, right? 1, 0, 1, 5. It is 5. I can always write it as the sum of 5 cones of determinant 1, right? I can do this. And these are all, if you compute it, they all have determinant 1. But I got 5 of them. I didn't gain much, right? Can I do with less than five, but smaller determinants? Ideas? Well, here it was, all, it was a sum of cones, right? What if I, I will allow also negative uh, to subtract a cone, for example. If I allow to subtract a cone, can you find a way to write it better? I gave you actually the example the first day when I define in modular. Do we agree that this one is unimodular? Cool. And what if I subtract this cone? This is zero one, right? And this is still one five. So, if I do red minus blue, what remains is green, right? But now both red and blue are unimodular cones. So that's what Barbenock does. And it works always, etc. This is just an example, but it's a rather complicated algorithm. It's a very neat uh, uh, proof and a very nice algorithm, but um, it's an algorithm. <laughs> And it results to a polynomial complexity of the algorithm we also discussed here in case the dimension is fixed. Otherwise, if the dimension is not fixed, everything is exponential, but uh, otherwise uh, we have a polynomial time algorithm. Okay, now, um, why did we need that? Because we want to enumerate the lattice points in the fundamental parallel pipette, right? This would be the third step in our algorithm. The first was McMahon lifting, the second was to eliminate the last coordinate. Now we need to compute the fundamental, the lattice points in the fundamental parallel pipette. One way to do it is Barvinok. Fine. Is there another way? Sure there is. Smith normal form. So, so what, does, what is Smith normal form? Um, let's say we have a matrix V, then we can write it, we can find unimodular matrices U and W such that the result is a diagonal matrix with the additional property that SI divides SI plus one, okay? So, how does this relate in any way to what we discuss? Modul unimodular transformations preserve lattice points. If we take uh, something, our cone, our space, right? 
and transform it using a unimodular transformation, which means multiplying with a unimodular matrix, lattice points will be mapped to lattice points. And yeah, so what happens here is we take our matrix V, which is our cone, and we transform it in some way, or yeah, we transform things and this is a diagonal, a diagonal matrix. So what happens is we take our um, funny looking uh, parallel piped. Sorry. Yeah. Diagonal or black diagonal? No, it is diagonal. These are factors, these are integers. These are integers dividing each other. Possibly zero in the end. It is one, not zero. Otherwise, the determinant, uh, the determinant would be zero. So these are called factors, actually. And obviously, the, the product is the determinant, right? So, so what happens is, and I will, not, I will not even try to get this right, which one is what, but one of these two matrices uh, takes our original thing and maps it to a square, right? It's a change of basis. So now we change the, we took essentially this as our basis. So now every point in here uh, is actually mapped to a point in this box. Finding the lattice points in a box, well, that's actually easy. It's all the points in, in a box, right? It's just ranges. So there's nothing simpler than that. And then after we find those, we just have to map them back uh, to, to the original lattice points in here. That's it. Simple, neat, and uh, let me give you the, the formula for that. Yeah, I'm jumping here now. So, we have a sum for k1 from 0 to s1 minus 1. Uh, we have a default sum. Right? These are the, this is the box. So we count every point in the box. We're summing over every point in this box. Well, it's not two dimensional, right? I'm just uh, drawing in 2D. Otherwise, it's in uh, D dimensions. And these are the lattice points in that box. Simple. And then what we want is Z to the 1 over SD, this being the last uh, factor, times we multiply our matrix V with W S1 prime, I will tell you what this is, times K1 SD prime KD transpose mod SD. Cool. That's it. Ah, yeah, so SI prime is uh, S SD divided by SI. So we know that SD is divided by all the previous ones, so that's an integer. So, okay, that's it. We just need to take some fractional, this mode is taking some fractional parts, and then we map them back by multiplying by this, and it is looking ugly. But it is explicit. So in terms of complexity, it's not better than Barvinok, of course, because here we have this exactly this exponential part we just discussed, right? Uh, but it is very, very explicit. You just plug in. You don't need to, to do anything smart. You just multiply things and see what, what they give you. Also, you see, this is how but ah, I have forgotten to say something very, very important. Everything I said today is joint work with uh, Felix Breuer. So, and here is uh, 
so Felix explained to me how this uh, Smith normal form, form thing works. And this is yesterday, I said that uh, the formula in the recursion of uh, Andres Paul Risse, so what, what the thing in the exponents with the remainders, blah, 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 was there. This was Andrius, 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 Andrius genius, genius, right? So that's the not so genius way to do it. It's the same formula actually, but in general. So, and we are done, right? Are we done? I have like 10 minutes, right? So we compute the fundamental parallel piped either by Barvenok or by this explicit formula. We computed these rational functions. We can sum them up, or we think we can sum them up. I'm not going to talk about this, but this is the actual bottleneck in all of these algorithms is to do rational function arithmetic. You get a bunch of, co of uh, rational functions. You cannot sum them up. So simple. In theory, it's nothing. In practice, this is the bottleneck in almost every implementation. Okay, and indeed we are done. So questions? Good. Now, one thing is uh, I like to stay at this level. Of course, you want to reach there in order to get your Q-series. By the way, where are the Q-series? You have no Q-series here yet? Okay, let me just... Uh, In case you didn't notice the Q series, I think actually this is the one thing I shouldn't have erased. So here we have a, for some polyhedron, a rational function in many variables, right? So this this counts uh, so this is in whatever set we want to enumerate right it, it is that and this means again and where is the q series so this is a full generating function what we call a full generating function uh, just take this and say Q, 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 D times, right? And that's your counting generating function. So that's it. Uh, this is how the Q series come into play. And the only thing is that here, you may have too many simplifications that you don't have there, right? Which uh, is what leads to nice Q series and also leads to not being able to figure out where they come from. Because uh, here you see exactly what is happening. I know exactly every single partition is visible here, while here, half of them, I mean, many of them just disappeared for some reason. I mean, the reason being that there was some simplification. So, okay, and I like simplifications as well. I mean, I will not complain about that. Uh, questions? Do we have a concrete, small example? How concrete and how small is <laughs> the question? <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, let's do. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't really want to do the elimination by hand. Uh, isn't this example uh, lovely? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, so, okay. Here, okay. 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, this will bite me later. I'm not sure if it's uh, smaller or larger, but okay. So, I believe now it's, uh, it's probably better. Uh, So what are these two points? The audience. <laughs> I'm really bad at this. I, I'm good at coding things that do these computations. So if I start at the point, this is the point zero, zero, minus five, and I want to hit the xy plane, which means that the last coordinate must be zero. So what I will do is I will take minus five, one, zero, two, plus two times zero, zero, minus five. Eh? No, that's not what I want, right? What do I want? You want that dish? Hmm? You want that? I want that? So, what is this? Minus five. Uh, zero. Minus five zero zero, right? Yes. So this is the point uh, minus five zero zero. And for that point, I take minus five zero one three plus three times zero zero minus five. And this is, well, I know that one. And this is zero and this is three, right? This would be minus three or something. Maybe, maybe uh, plus five and minus three. Here? Like this? And shall I get a five here? Okay. So, and now, now you believe me. Did I erase it? No, that's it, right? This is what we just did. It, it was that one. This, uh, we don't do anything else in this algorithm. So we computed now these two points. These were the apices of the two cones, which uh, now what I need to compute is this. Okay. Plus? Yeah, thanks. So, okay, let's take uh, this cone, C1. So C1, I want to find the generators. I know that the apex of this cone is uh, five. Uh, five, zero, zero. And I know it also, well, everything is closed for the moment. So that's an openness, we don't care. But uh, I need to find two generators here. What are
case you were wondering, we described this polyhedron. Which I hope is the correct one. Right? So I know that five is okay, but I'm not sure. The inclination should be different. Did we do something wrong? I think so here, <coughs> here it's something should have been three and two. No? What? The apex is wrong. Uh, We will figure this out uh, until tomorrow. But yeah, that, I mean, that's a computation. This, is, uh, this algorithm is implemented in, uh, in Sage. We have a package called Polyhedral Omega. Uh, this is, again, joint work with uh, Felix Breuer. And um, everything is in the paper in uh, Annals of Combinatorics from 2017, I assume which is a rather uh, voluminous and uh, uh, and tomorrow I want to continue with uh, this example and discuss specific uh, types of uh, partitions for example that uh, you want to compute how, how to how they fit in this setting and if we have two different types of partitions that we assume, how, how do we, like counting one and the other and showing that they are the same, okay? So, questions, except for that one. Okay, then we'll continue tomorrow.